My agent, who from Miami, called me and said, we need to do this thing last minute. What is it? What is it? We need to go to Washington. So I flew into Washington, and uh, I don't even know what it was, blah, blah, blah. Warm-up set. DJ warm-up set for James Brown concert. Uh, what? S- stop. Killer, killer, podcast. Killer, killer, official dot com. <laughs> you need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Killer Keller podcast. Once, boom, 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 boom. Everywhere. Let's, let's get into this. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller podcast live and direct, central London or as central as you need to be. Uh, my guest will testify to that and travelling across the, the breadth of the, the city, the capital. Uh, big shout out to Graffiti and Silco UK. Hold tight, everyone has got the television app, free download, Android, iPhone, if you street culture, sports, you know what it is. Um, yeah, you're on now. Uh, if you're not uh, watching, you're listening, big up yourselves. Uh, inside the place. Oh my God, like, I can't remember a time where I, I didn't know the face of this man. I can't remember a time where he wasn't influential in my world as, as a music fanatic and furthermore supporter of my projects, my work, from Day Dot, Metalheads, One Extra, new name, producer, DJ Extraordinaire, the mighty, come on, Bailey um, inside the place. I'm here, <laughs> at last, after watching it and I, I'm sitting right here, so this is nice for me, you know what I'm saying? Hey look, seriously, I, it's one of these ones where all of a sudden it dawns on me, I'm like, oh, actually, I'm talking to someone that I aspired to do this sort of shit with, you know, like... Really, really? Yeah, man, come on. Like, I didn't know about that. Yeah, absolutely. You're a presenter. Yeah. You're a presenter. Mm-hmm. And, and at its core, like, a, an entertainer of of, uh, of a multiple genres. Like, it's not just... I mean, I know you're drum and bass, but, you know... Oh, you... yeah, you know, so, for example, if I go to Sun and Bass, they have alternative sets. Oh, we do, actually, an unofficial uh, opening party and ending party, and that's... There's no drum and bass at all. It's, like, whatever brings the vibe, you know what I mean? Yeah, and bring the vibe you do. For those of you who don't know, know about... DJ Bailey, and then there is some catching up to do on this particular podcast, man. Mm. Um, I've been privy, I'm, I can't remember, what, I think it might have been Egg or something like that in King's Cross, mm. where you were setting up, and I swear to God, man, like the vibe that you bring to a set, swear to God. Thank it, you, man. It's, Thank the, you. It's, the, it's, the, it's the secret ingredient, and I still can't figure yeah. it out. Um, well, I used to be a hip hop DJ. That's what the secret ingredient is because um, I love breakbeats. Mm. I love simple bass lines. I love melodies, violin, and being brought up on Motown and stuff. Mm. I love like violins, melodies, like deep stuff. So I don't like to go all too, like even if it is quite techno, it's got to have some sort of real nice groove to it, you know what I mean? Mm. So it you know, penetrates the mind and mm. the heart. Um, and that's kind of always what I'm aiming, aiming for. You wouldn't believe the amount of music. I'm just like, yeah, it's good, but nah. Yeah, it's good, but nah. Yeah, it's, good. it's just got, to, I've got to go. I can feel something from that. Whether I'm happy or like there's a dark one or whatever. So it's just about a feeling, isn't it? Soul. Mm, yeah. Soul in something. Yeah. Yeah, breakbeats are, 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 are the key ingredient to some of the most earliest jungle that I love. It's just knowing that it feels dangerous. It feels like there's no there's no sync. There's no click. Mm. It's like they're going... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, there's energy to it, isn't there? Yes, the energy and the freedom of the breakbeats, you know what I mean? Rather than... The, oh, it's, for me, uh, drum machines, even though they fit in well now... Um, it's really kind of, it's too digital, it's too, you know what I mean? Like, when I go to America and the roads are like this, or like that. <laughs> I like it in, in the UK when the roads are all over the place like this. Yeah. It's sort of a bit of like, oh, you don't know, it's like the unexpected, you know what I mean? That's like, it's such a great analogy. The geographics of music as well, when you think about it like that, no wonder our music is, well, off the cuff. It's a little bit kind of, how do you think of that? It's yeah. because everything that we've been brought up to understand has just been a little bit off the cuff, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and like drum and bass jungle made itself up as it, it's still making itself up as it goes along. And uh, it abuses what things are being made for. So like that, like Dillinger is distortion, you know what I mean? Mm. You're not supposed to make distortion sound good, oh, but he does. Mm, he does, yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's like that. That's why I like drum and bass. You just don't know what's coming next. You don't know what's coming mm. next. And by God, like over the last, even you know, like, since the lockdown, there's been this resurgence of like a new generation mm. of people that are coming through. And Amen Jump Up just seems to be very much the order of the day. Yeah. 
I mean, certain parts of there's different. See, people understand when you say drum and bass and jungle, it's not just you know. There's lots of splits of scenes. Factions. Mm. Yeah, you got jump up, you got the liquid, you got the dark stuff, you got the minimal stuff, you got all kinds of stuff. You know what I mean? And um, you know, it's just at the moment jump up. Is ha just having a moment, you know what I mean, mm. right? It will never disappear. It will just like something else will come along. People go, oh wow, what's this in this dark side or whatever? What's this over mm. here? Just at the moment, there are actually a hell of a lot of new, young, talented uh, producers in Jump Up making really cool shit. When it's really kind of not necessarily like Jump Up, it's kind of something darker to it. And that's mm. what I like. That's why I like Hazard stuff because he has that Ooh. dark tinge to it. And yeah. I love it, man. You know what I mean? That's so interesting you say that. There is like a like, if you, if you put it in the, in this, in a scan of a Mario, you know, starting a Mario Brothers game where you've got all the the whole island and you've got to go round it to get mm. to each level. That's drum and bass in my mind. It's like different layers of different areas and mm. different parts to it. You could never really put your finger on it. Yeah, can you? you don't even know what the next level is going to be. There's going to be a moment when, like, all of a sudden, there's this amazing liquid stuff around. Not that there's not amazing stuff now, but there's going to be a moment where it's like, wow, who's this new producer? And then, then, then next thing, your collection or your music selection is just. You, you realize it's grown in that area, and then you're into that vibe for a minute. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't like to pin myself down to any vibe. I just like to go with, well, I've got a batch of this and I've got a batch of that, and you know, I like to run mm. with that. You, know? yeah, you mean record collection as a whole? So you yeah. you've been in it for a long time, and like you mm. say, the hip hop aspect of of your your uh, flavor, the kind of things that you're into from a outsider drum and bass mm. world. Like you must have a vast kind of knowledge and understanding of records and Oh yeah. And my good friend, big respect to AJ Scratch, hard noise. Oh, you know hold I mean? tight. Hard he noise knows crew. he on. knows, he knows. We can go deep on breakbeats, you know, let alone the actual tracks themselves. You know what I mean? He comes around we talk music and rah rah rah, you know what I mean? Go through some of the old hard noise demos mm. he's found as well. Um yeah man, I mean like because of buying physical records, if you say to me, oh, this tune, I, I can like instantly picture, you know, the, the spine of the track, what colour it is, because I, I put my records into, like, here's the blue colours, here's red, here's black. And if someone says, oh, Royal Run, upstate now, oh, that's yellow, let me just pull that out, go to the yellow section, you know what I mean? What? That's yeah. bonkers. That's like what happens when you buy records one by one, you remember taking it home, you're like, okay, yeah, you play it for a bit, and then you say, right, you belong here, you know what I mm. mean? And you can find things quickly, grey section, white section, blah, 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 whatever the spines are, and it's sort of like a rainbow se you know, selection of stuff. That's sick. The synesthesia in that, it's like that feeling of like, because it's a colour, mm. and it represents an audio, it's almost like that's, these are the creative buttons yeah. that you push yeah. as an artist, isn't like, it? Next plateau that's all red right red and black you've got tough city that's like pink you know with the uh, uh, yellow and green on it you know what i mean you've got flipping um early prison records with big daddy kane and uh, biz marquee with the red the blue. and blue yeah that's it's right got blue and it's like you know what i mean i just remember all that because you remember all the labels you know what i mean yeah you know, and they were all you know i had to have the imports you know what i mean none of those you know champion records thin thin wobbly. not in it that yeah, without yeah. the spine shit yeah yeah yeah, yeah really thin. Yeah. yeah with the uk remixes a lot of times yeah, like, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want the import with the cellophane on it. Mm. And then I take the... I'm sorry, anal about it. That I would take... After you, like, open it and that, uh, I would tape the top of the cellophane to the inside so that it stays with the cellophane on. Because you know it starts ripping after a while? Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I did. I do all that, man. You know what I mean? So, How many records have you got? Uh, something like over 8,000. Oh, look, man. <laughs> That's a really... I, yeah, yeah, I know okay, it's an listen, endless listen, question. Listen. Look, it's confession time. R Spice alert. Switch it on. Talk to me. I sold all of them. You sold all your records? I sold all 8,000. They're all gone. What? I bulk, bulk, I sold them. You sold them? I sold them, all of them. They're all gone. So where are they now? They're in, uh, I don't know where they are now. Really? Probably split off and whatever. Have you, are you serious? I've done, yeah, yeah. Like my life's like collection, that is about 8,000 records all gone. So what have you put them onto the hard drives, right? I, um, I bought a lot of CDs, I ripped a lot of them, and I got a lot of MP3s. Um, basically what it was, I had so many records, the place where I'm living now, they just they were never there and they were five minutes away, like not that long a walk. But that sounds at, a lot, isn't it? At my mum's house. And I was like, yeah, but how often am I using those? You know what I mean? How I mean, they've got memories, like they, then the trips to the record shop, all individually, imagine them individually bringing back 8,000 records, you know what I mean? Yeah. They've got stories there, but is the format more important than the actual music itself? Because when I put the music on, it's what how that makes me feel. I don't care if it's on the cassette, it's on a CD, or something. You know, I hear tunes, I'm like, wow, I've got to have that. You know what I mean? Mm. So now it's all it's, all it's all computers, and I have even more than ever now because I can go, oh, let me get that, mm. let me get that, let me get that. And it's not taking up any more room than the hard drive. Yeah. But to, um, you know... Do you miss them? 
I have. I've had dreams about them. Yeah, I've I, had I do dreams. My tapes, my mixtapes. Yeah, I wish I'd never got rid of the things. You know. Yeah, I, I wouldn't get a hold. It's only see when I'm doing this sort of things. Like, there's things I've given away, even like t-shirts and trains. Mm. If I can't get them back again, I ain't giving them away. I know I can get these things again. If I really want that record, and I've toyed with, oh, let me get that record and blah blah blah. But like, okay, I'm gonna play it once, and it's not gonna be used. If I say, all right, I want to play this track, I go to the computer, blah, 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 mm. and there's the tune. Mm. It's quicker, you mm. know what I mean? I have to put the turntable on. Da, 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 da. By the way, I'm never giving away my turntables. <laughs> never. I would be shocked and appalled if you did. I've had those with. They've been with me for since since 1989. Ten, 12 tens. 12, 1200s. 12, with, with the Adder flight cases. Mm. The black ones. They, these ones are grey. Silver, 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 silver. Silver, the classics, yeah. Yeah, and um, I've been through all sorts of things with them. They've been stolen from a party and I've got them back from the police. And Oh, that's the... You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not selling those, you know what I mean? Mm. Like, no. And, and everything works around them, really, isn't it? This, the, you know. Yeah. But another thing, to you know, to round up the whole sort of like no more records thing is like... It'd be great if I had records. Like if I had played my whole set on records, that'd be great. But not everyone's sending records out anymore. Mm. I used to get so many records in the mail, I had to put a special post box on the side of the house. Mm. But now you go to clubs, they ain't even got turntables there. <laughs> and if they do, they set them up with the bass bins under it yeah. and you've got this feedback. So it's just not, it just doesn't yeah. really make sense anymore. I've been thinking about that with Serato. Like, how does that fare when you are up against it? To that levels of frequency it must be quite hard for some because scratch DJs. See, big up Chip oh, Shop, yeah. of course. You know yeah, they yeah, they've yeah. got that thing down. In fact, you know, in fact, they they do have noise restrictions here and there, don't they? But um, mm. yeah, can you imagine being up against you know a sound system valve or some shit? <laughs> yeah, exactly, and just like pure feedback. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With Serato though, Serato and vinyl, it's not a problem because it's digital. It's not actually taking the vibrations off. It's just sending a digital signal to the computer. Uh, so that's okay. Mm. But when you're using actual proper real vinyl, you know mm. what I mean? Uh, you know. Traditional vinyl, as we know, old school. Then that's a real problem, mm. and that's why like people like scream when they first started going to New York and all that, and they were cutting dub plates. They stopped doing it because it's just all the feedback and those record needles mm. are skipping. The and technology everything. was too ahead of it for the vinyl to keep up. Yeah, yeah, it was just you got skipping records everywhere. So um, you know, it's a it's a matter of a little bit of necessity. And well, I just I wasn't using the record. I wasn't using the record collection. Yeah. I wasn't using it. Big shout out to everybody that does, the, you know, they do the seven inch record specials, you know, when they, you know. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. And the resurgence of vinyl in the independent market for, for jungle and drum and bass is great. You get the special colours, the ones with the little, look like skittles all over it with little, look like oh, fireworks on the vinyl. Yeah, 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 yeah Reinforce yeah. doing stuff, Deep Jungle doing good stuff. You've got Scientific Wax doing yeah. amazing stuff. Big up Reinforce as well. Yeah, they've got beautiful collectible <sighs> bits of vinyl. So it's still great to have that and that's a very strong market right now. Big big labels such as Reinforced and Metalheads, of course, they I won't say they can afford to. They've got an established brand. They've mm. got an established label mm. um, with an audience that just lap that stuff up. I love it when they do. They push the boat because they can, right? Mm. That's that's the beauty of it. Yeah. It's a very, very collectible market and to the point where people will they'll buy a release and they'll put it on Discogs, double the price, you know what I mean? Mm. And people will buy it because the scarcity of that stuff as well, because it's coloured, uh, vinyl or whatever, or special runs, this limited, isn't it? So mm. people know that it's going to be worth value as soon as they buy it. So it's still, vinyl is still a very strong market, mm. but just not practical for me. Plus, you know, if I'm in the party and I'm playing, I'm like, oh, let me play this now. Mm. And it's there, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a luxury, isn't it? Imagine taking 8,000 records on tour with you. That's technically what I'm doing, though. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, if yeah. I took actual physical records, I mean, yeah, it's just not doable, is it? We're so lucky to be alive right now for these kind of realities. To yeah. A couple of USB sticks and you're off to the races. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's all it, all it takes now. Yeah. Let's take it back. Let's go back to the original. Let's go back to early, early, early Bailey, like before the Metalheads, before everything. How did it all... I mean, we talked about hip-hop, but how did it all begin, brother? Um, my parents liked music a lot. And in, in those days, and we're talking about the 70s now, right? Um, in those days, the setting in London wasn't right for black people to go to clubs, you know what I mean? Mm. So they'd buy records and then have you know, parties in their houses and we'd end up called, they were called blues parties later on. But they were, um, yeah, and they just had a big record collection. So I was just, I understood somehow the value of music and really just got into it. And like when they sort of like stopped playing records later on because of, I don't know why, I started holding the records, you know what I mean? And then like, you know what, mm, I need, mm -hmm. it's good now, I need some more records, so I'll go and buy 
another confession. I went and bought, <laughs> my mum gave me a little bit of money and I went and bought Hey Mickey by Tony Basil on 7-inch. No, oh, come I bought, on. I bought Roland rap, rap, Rapping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> dude, we must be the same age. We must be a similar sort of age, you know, in the in uh, Maybe. The I'm always usually older than everybody, to be honest. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> I've always yeah. seen you as the young gun, the, the, uh, yeah, well, the whole yeah. collective man, always. Well, I was born in 71. Okay, so, all right. There's uh, what age difference is there between us? There's about six years difference. Okay, yeah, 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 okay. So it's in rel- in re- relativity terms, it's like I was more respectfully. I was more kind of engaged because you and me were of an age. Mm. I, I knew you were a bit more of a go-to kind of person. Yeah, in that yeah, respect. yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, the way young people perceive older music? Yeah, but it it's, keeps going around in circles. They the resurgence of finding those real rare seven inches has kind of happened again. Mm. Like in the, uh, I forgot what it's called now, uh, that Northern Soul kind of vibe, you know what I mean? Finding those little, uh, your, you know, that ones that, yeah. that's how the Rare Groove thing happened, didn't it? Mm-hmm. It was like, that's oh, right. let me just find that. Oh, what's this? What's this? What's this? That Northern Soul mo- yeah, movement man. was crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the most unsuspecting of places to suddenly just blow these rare soul, like hard to find yeah. imports. Man. And it was just sort of like, it was just, there was no dominating names. It was always just... Oh, that's a good tune. People are gonna like that, yeah. and people—that's what people go to these parties for—to hear those rare things. Which is like, wow, what's this? And they didn't know who it is. Did your parents into like the jazz fusion stuff? The kind of the, not at all. It was just my mum was Motown, and my stepfather was just—it was like Big Youth and Bob Marley and Doctor Alimentado, Green Sleeves, and all oh. this sort of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, um, yeah, those those kind of things. So at one hand, I had the Motown from my mum, and the other hand, I had like roots reggae and stuff mm. from my stepfather. So yeah. The blending of those two, you know, with drum and bass, mm. the dub bass lines and the soulfulness. Mm. That's like, wow. Plus the hip hop break beats, so those like three things at once. It's, wow. Mm. You imagine, that's why I got glued to it, you know? The, the hip hop thing became like a, a wash in, into modern day music culture. Mm. It's actually unthinkable. To, 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 how it even got to that point, to, even to the point where we are now, mm. having influenced all these generations of music further down the line mm. that must have been a revelation when you heard hip hop using the breaks and the samples that your parents that yeah and just putting my favourite parts of the record on loop and just people rapping over it adding that extra bit of spice I was, yeah. yeah it was magical man I used to go to the Tim Westwood jams you know what I mean my friend would be with me Brian with his polka dot like Kwame pants all flared out and stuff you know what I mean like yeah, I mean, yeah. we were in the trenches with a little, you know, the flat tops with the little, <laughs> I mean, the slant Was it like Stonebridge and all those kind of spots? He used to do a bunch of places. He used to do um, Dingwalls. Dingwalls. When, I think we were still on Capital. Mm. And we used to go down Dingwalls, you know what I mean? Mm. And uh, yeah, I was fully into it. We even tried to um, start a hip hop group, you know what I mean? I think I've got the demos still. What was the name? Uh, oh my God. God, I can't even remember. We didn't even get to that point. So we did all these recordings and the guy from the label, he just didn't follow through, you know what I mean? I didn't even know what we were calling ourselves, but I used to call myself the black technician. Because <laughs> 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 you know that time of black medallions and all that, we was like, yeah, black, te- black technician. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Blacked out tint shades and everything, I suppose. Yeah, right? I mean, like, just as militant as you could look, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. With yeah, the totally. beads and all that, you know what I mean? Pre- you're pre Kabachi Sly and, and the team. Oh, was it was that era? Was it that era? Uh, it was. It was late. It was about eighty six, eighty seven. Man, wow! So that's, that's crazy. Eighty six, eighty seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh. So who was around in the around that time? Eighty six. I mean, this was as it was ex- it, importing itself over, really, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. And at the same time, un, un, you know, unknown to me, like house music was creeping into the UK as well. You know what I mean? <sighs> yeah. And. What made me switch from hip hop to house? Obviously, like the early days of the Rude Boys in that and that sort of stuff in hip hop. You know, if you step on a man's shoe, it's like it's drama. You know, what I'm saying in the party, and uh, um, that was a slightly unfriendly vibe. But when house music came along, it was all very love. You step on someone, they say sorry to you. You know what I mean? Oh, sorry, mate. I didn't realise at the time it was all drug fuel. Sounds like me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, mate. Sorry, sorry you know mate. I mean? Didn't mean you to tread on me. <laughs> it was friendly, and then like '88, like from the '88 to '89, you had. The house mixing up with breakbeats in it, mm. and I was like, "That's what pulled me over." I was like, "Wow, what's this? The vibe of the people mm. and the house mixing with breakbeats." I was like, "Oh, this is cool." You know what I mean? So, Got a big up Groove Rider and Fabio for that one. Mm, mm. Doing all kinds of weird shit, like taking yeah. they were doing taking bug in the bass bin, which was thirty three, putting it up and playing forty five. Just and then, you could yeah. just experiment them days. You know what I mean? DJs have always been the prominent fixtures of creating and innovating. J 
judging by gauge of audience and crowd and mm. um and yeah just going back to that transition between hip hop into house um the breakbeat again just seemed to be very much the order of the day it just slid on in there yeah yeah and it's that's my thing the breakbeat man the percussive element the, the, the you know what i mean just the, uh the tribal thing of the drums that's why i don't really necessarily like the drum and drum machine things unless the melodies are really nice you know what mm. i mean i've got to have at least if there's a little shuffle of a break beat in the background to give it more swing mm. then i'm quite happy with that you know but i just love a break beat what is it about drum and bass man what, I mean, what is it what is it about drum and bass that makes it longevity and makes it feel so ever everlasting and endless and just a constant um yeah ecosystem it's a reflection of a direct reflection of everybody's lives like before I mean even if it's got no lyrics in it you know what I mean you've got you can hear everybody in it you know what I mean so when we were like say Blue Note 95 when that came along and it was real hard times economically you know what I mean you could mm. hear that struggle in the music you could hear the aggression oh, you could yeah. hear the breakbeats you could hear the dub bass sounds from the influences of like you know what I mean Afro-Caribbean people we were blah 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 you could hear the techno influence coming in from you could hear everything that we was around us in London and in the yeah. UK you could hear it in the music, yeah, yeah, and that's why you're drawn to it. Plus the energy of it, and the there's so many people. dynamics to it. It's a lot to it. So much, so much to it. And there's this, there is. I mean, we're getting to the more commercial side of it as time goes. Because mm. in this conversation, I really want to get a bit into yeah, the, the that Blue Note time, and how yeah, how was that partnership with Metalheads, Goldie, Doc? Or how was that? How was that alliance forged? Because you were there mm. from its inception pretty much, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I was working in Apple Records in Croydon, which is actually the birthplace of dubstep, you know, and so this is before that happened, you know what I mean? I was saying drum and bass on the first floor. And um, that was exactly the moment when uh, a record came into the store. Uh, Metalheads, new label, you know what I mean? Uh, drums, whatever it was, Drums 95, I think mm -hmm. it was, Drums 95, Drums yeah. 95. And the other side was like mm. Riders Ghost, mm. it was a green label. And then uh, just through being on pirate radio stations and my good friend MC Flux introducing me to Chemistry and Storm, they said, hey, we're doing this thing called Metalheads, do you want to play? I was like, yeah. I didn't know how big it was going to be. I was like, yeah. And then I went down there and it was like, yeah, I discovered that it was Goldie and Dot Scott started the label. Chemistry and Storm were looking after the management of the label and stuff like that. Crazy. Um, yeah, man. It was all sort of like in the beginning, like there was using potato stamp and that sort of stuff to the label. It was really kind of a small budget thing. Um, but with Goldie as the front man, you know what I mean? That's what kind of makes it really just like really, yeah, yeah. really shine. You know what I mean? So, mm. yeah, it was a mixture of like just a lot of people who are passionate about a certain thing. And mm. Goldie having come off of Reinforced with that dark sound. Mm. It was like sort of like more of that, you know. Important of, of having a brand, I think. And yes, the, the, the name, the, the logo itself. But when you've got a fierce front man, mm. all of you actually, when I think about it now, like there was such characters, there was yeah. elements, you know, aspects to this yeah. whole label. Everyone had their own little thing. And the thing with Goldie and his energy, you don't have to know him to feel the energy. Mm. Like he brought that whole, because he used to like go down to AWOL, uh, and hear Randall play the reinforced dark stuff and and all that, and just be swinging, literally swinging off the poles of the DJ booth, just hanging around it and swinging. You know what I mean? Oh, and like Wolf whistling as he does. <laughs> and stuff. He brought that. He brought that energy right into, you know, carried that on energy right into into Blue Note mm. for the Metalhead sessions, and it was just infectious. You know what I mean? And then you'd hear just the same way Groove Rider and Fabio and everybody was experimenting with the music. You know, it, the room was full of producers full of people hearing some stuff and then going wow they're influenced they go home they want to make something uh, more interesting or uh, not to, not they wouldn't copy styles they would be going i want to make something more weird and more deeper mm. than that and then you just build this huge catalog of really just really interesting music because they're just experimenting that's what wow. metal has give you the freedom to do you know? yeah I feel like overwhelmed by it all because like you were at an age where it's like <clears> and also you were you were under the wing of these guys that mm. were creating this this label and you were part of the machine almost. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't aware of what I was involved in. We were just, it was just happening, mm. you know what I mean? You were just in the moment and you didn't know, you couldn't see, see, have seen ahead, but we knew that, I mean, the vibe was, we just cared about the vibe at the, at the time. Mm. That room was packed up. Yeah, the, the Gallagher brothers coming through. You had uh, Lady Miss Care uh, coming through. You had David Bowie passed through. Casual. You had um, all these like celebrities passing through. Actually, you know, when we went to, we was at, uh, at Dingles in Camden, I see um, 
Scary Spice and Baby Spice were in there. <laughs> so, yeah, for over the, throughout the years... Like have, we're on to something here, gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, this is, oh, these people are interested. We must be doing uh, something. something. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, spoke to an, it spoke to the nation. That's what it did. Yeah. Um, the, you, your silhouette within the, the crew, the collective, for me personally, it had a ground level. It was almost like you were... You were the, you were one of us. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, you were the person in my in my humblest where I thought to myself, yeah, I can relate with him because mm. he's one of us. He's like mm. he would be in the dance floor dancing. Yeah, or just in the corner. Like a, pe- a lot of people confuse my, my my sometimes my face or me actually not even dancing. With me not enjoying myself. Well, that baby face. I don't believe it. What are you talking about? Gave yourself. About? <laughs> what are you talking about, man? I'm just like I'm absorbing, like mm. just taking it in. It's hitting me. You know what I mean? Just like you can feel the resonance yeah. from the speakers. You know, and and you just I'm taking it all in. I'm mm. absorbing the atmosphere. You know mm. what I mean? But there are times. You know what I mean? As I I didn't even start drinking till I was 21. But once that happened, I'm also mm. very shy at the time, mm. and. Um, Drinking made me just like what? just dance and enjoy myself more. You know what I mean? Um, was drinking a thing? Was that was that a thing that? Oh man, I could do with that out of my life as a crutch. To be quite honest, yeah, it's I mean, one of those... I'm, I'm sort of easing up now because mm. I noticed the little belly's growing, and I don't want none of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, I but you. in those days, it's like, yeah, it wasn't important. Like people. Old friends of mine from school now, and uh, we go somewhere have a drink. Oh my god, you used to to drink orange juice and stuff. That was, there was known mm. for that. Mm. Um, they're surprised. I started drinking really late. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it made me discover a lot about myself. You know what I mean? And be really comfortable with who I am, rather than just sort of like this shrinking violet in the corner, listening to mm. music. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, man, um, it was just it was a lot to take in at the time, man. It was a lot to take in. So I'll just be like this in the corner, like this. Yeah. Just like the rest of us. Yeah, I mean, I was never sort of like, well, I'm Bailey, I just played. I was just like, yeah. No. You know, it was nice to be, to give as well as be part, you know what I mean? As, as well as, as well, it was nice to be part of it as well as enjoying it as yeah. a, like, I saw myself as the punter as well, you know what I mean? That's what I've really valued about, yeah. like, seeing you play. Mm. And I think that, that connection, it runs in tandem with, with hip hop and any other genre when you see a a guy, Mr. Thing. Did you hear Mr. Thing, for instance? Oh, God, yeah. Do you know what I mean? He's another one. I'll put you in the same stable as them as, like, they, they'd be doing this at home. Yes. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They just happen to be doing it here in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, that yeah. kind of thing, right? Yeah, exactly. You couldn't help it. You just couldn't help it. And it was a great escape for me, you know what I mean? Uh, obviously, my parents weren't the richest people. So when the music came along, I had something to, just, you know, to occupy me. And, like, i never forget the day. I think it was 1980. 18. What? No, it was, like, I think it was 89 when Big Fun by Inner City came out. Woo. And I bought that. And uh, that was my favourite record at the time. I bought mm. the import on KMS and all that, yeah. Mm. And my mum come home from work and I was just start, I had a box room, you know what I mean? And I, my mum, I was just dancing in the doorway like this. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> my mum looked at me like I was crazy, but she didn't understand how important that release was for me. Mm. Like, wow, this, I'm just, the music was going right through me. So music is really... Really looked after me, like mentally, you know what I'm saying? Whereabouts, whereabouts uh, is your family from South London? Uh, yes, We've, yeah. I was born in Bread, South London. Born in Battersea, lived in Tooting, went to school in Tooting. Yeah. Same school as uh, Sadiq. Uh, uh, is it Sadiq Khan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's same school. Lie. Yeah, Sadiq, I think is that the mayor. Yeah, it's all right. It's all <laughs> yeah, right. we went to Ernest Bevin. You know what I mean? He was like the year below me, actually. Really? Um, so I went to Tooting, and then we moved um, over into Fort and Heath, and I've been there for like thirty whatever years. Oh, yeah, so now. South, South, yeah. South, always South. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always wanted to drive her places, but you know, now the missus has come along, and she just loves it. This, so I was like, okay, love yeah. is love, man. We'll just stay here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it works. Yeah. One extra um, was um, where you helped me immensely, particularly with the remixes and records that yeah, I was doing at the yeah. time, man. Um, big up for that. No, you're welcome, man. All day, like, you know, all day. It's good as good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, there was this early adoptive attitude to, to DJs and one extra of that time. Big up Excalibur as well, another yeah, you know, UK yeah, pop. Yeah, you know, a lot of so many people that I just feel like, you know, it was almost like clear deck, we've got a new mm. business model. But for the time, you guys were the ears to the streets and one extra really didn't have a clue you guys were doing it. Yeah. How did that all come about? Um they what re- 
what I really wanted in the beginning was that pirate feel to it. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, for me, how I got on there, and the same guy that introduced me to like house music in the early um, that crossover period uh, in the early or mid eighties. Um, it was the same guy who had a friend who had a partner who was working at the BBC and it was just like, you know, he hit me up saying, oh, the BBC is starting this new station. Uh, it was, it's going to be called Network X. That's what it was called originally, Network X. And, uh, you know, would you be interested? I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, again, same Blue Night situation. I didn't know what this, you know, mm -hmm. what was in front of me. So, yeah, I tried. So I went down, down to Yording House in central London, which is where the... BBC Radio One Studios were at the time, and they just they had four studios down there, and they just shoved me in one studio and said, "Well, do a show, put the duct tape in, in and left the room." So I was like, "Well, I've done pirate for years, mm -hmm. so I'm very used to being on my own and not having an MC. Every now and then I had flux, but I was always on my own. Mm -hmm. So I just created like you know fake features and top tens and said things within the show rather than just playing music. You know, I just mm -hmm. hosted it and talked about the music because obviously you know with the hip hop days I know the colours of things da, 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 and mm. I was going around the people goes back to the source scene eh? so I just told stories you know what I mean and then uh, I was about two or three months in and uh, not being told anything just once a week going to the studio and recording it was like we want you to do a show I was like okay sure so 2003 I went on to uh, uh, one extra you know what I mean mm. and uh, I was there for 10 years which is was, wasn't supposed to happen <sighs> so do you want me to go deep on that go deep on that please Basically, spice it up, spice person, up your life. The personalities at Radio One were so big that it became an artist led station. So they'd be quite bossy and they'd leave mm. it. And they had their own production company and stuff like that. When one, when it was set up, they absolutely did not want that. They wanted to have full control of what happened on that station. This is our station. You do what we say. Mm. So the whole thing was all right, no one should be there longer than four years. Right, and then we have just keep the talent fresh. You do what you do. What we it wasn't like Gestapo style, you know what I mean? Mm. But they did want you to toe the line. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, and well, I ended up staying double that and more. You know what I mean? So I just felt quite special. You mm. know what I mean? There was a couple of times when I actually got offered contracts that were like two years long, and you're only supposed to be contract renewed every year. So I was just thinking, ah, you can't get rid of me yet, can you? Mm. I'm too deep in this. So I felt really happy. and Good position to be in, yeah, for sure. The very last show, because um, you can plod along and not really understand your impact. And uh, the very last show was the one that made me go... I had no idea. I, I, yeah, I mean, wow. So there had been years that had gone by when I sort of illegally brought booze into the BBC and we'd have Christmas parties and stuff like that in the outside area of the studio. And mm. Everyone have a drink, have a drink, have a drink. But this one, I thought, you know what? It's the last one, like, whatever. So I went down to Costco. I spent £400 on booze, right? Ooh. I, <laughs> I brought it in in a suitcase, right? And I invited all my people. Listen, people, this is my last one. This one, this one. Chase and Status turned up. Andy C turn, turned up. Hazard, who doesn't come out of the house for less than three grand, <laughs> uh, out, turned up. You know what I mean? I had people who, Dillinger was there. You know what I mean? Like people who normally wouldn't bother get out of bed for whatever, unless they're working, right. all came. And if you saw the picture of the photo of, of the people that were there, it was just like, wow. I was like, oh my God, all these people show me this Total love right now. validation of... It was really emotional and lovely. You know what I mean? Mm. If I ever accomplish anything else, I'm just be like, you know what? I did my bit here. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I'm very happy with that. Very happy. That's incredible. Yeah. J just salute from peers, salute from the industry all in one snapshot. Yeah. Like, was there ever like a level of, I say PTSD very lightly, but you know, to come off the, come off the ride like that, knowing oh, I kind of, accomplished such a well it was an accomplishment of a greater level that not many people could achieve was there was there a f reasoning in yourself trying to think things or well, what's next i did think about it and i don't know man i really don't know i really don't know how it happened like that i think everything i do i think everything i do is there was a, there's it's a level of innocence and honesty to it, mm. and I think people see that I'm just I'm just in it because I just love it, love it, love it. I'm not trying to be, hey everybody, I'm the big DJ, rah rah rah. You know what I mean? Unless someone like puts it on me and wants to test me back to back, then come I'm, fucking bring it, man. I'm not arrogant, you know what I mean? I just I, yeah. I just do my thing to the best of my ability, um, and I think people have appreciated that. And I, you know, 
the music policy was they weren't telling you at one extra but they wanted to be more and more commercial you could just feel it mm. and uh i just stuck to my guns and i think people appreciated that you know what i mean i was like well look i don't care if like this is the biggest tune i have favorite producers but i'm not going to play them just because it's them mm. i play what i think is good you know what i mean mm. and it could be anybody i've had people who've made tracks that um the, the quality was terrible, but the vibe, the music... Was on point. Crazy. Crazy. And that was some of the most popular tracks because it's like they had a feeling to it, you know what I mean? Feeling. Feeling yeah. is everything. It is. Trans, tr transforming is what that what that station did at One Extra... You know, because a lot of things did actually go straight to BBC, you know, the Groove Rider, Fabs, mm. Friction. You know, they, these were became staples on regular, mm. regular radio. Mm commerciality of the songs things started moving in a particular direction um what's your take on that what's your take on because i know you're a fan i know that there's not going to be a, any sort of uh spiciness to this but i'm more intrigued because um as somebody that was a conduit for so long of the underground sound mm. and how that underground sound actually was transferable to mm. to terrestrial radio mm. then came the commercial side of things <laughs> Yeah, for me, it's really, uh, I had to be really sensible in my thinking about this because it's not a matter of, oh, this is like cheesy, this is shit now, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this shouldn't be going on. I think it's important to have all the sounds there because, you know, and it's a part of the growth of the scene as well. You're going to have all this stuff. Um, back in the day when Jungle was peak and we had Bookham on, like, the two would not cross over. These people would be like, oh, that's like, that. what's that mean? This oh, is intelligent yeah. drum and bass. Mm. This is for us and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, what you didn't see is that, you know, you had uh, Jungle bringing in people from the reggae scenes and rare groove. You had um, Bookham bringing people in from house music. It's just, for me, more magnets. So... With the commercial side of it, same thing again. There's going to be people, people that might be like a little bit of rock or something mm. and say, oh, you know what, Pendulum, they're all right. Yeah, mm. well, let's go to a few drum bass raves and get pulled into our scene. It's very... Look, how many artists have you seen that said, sorry, everybody, like, I'm not not in this way, but like they've sort of taken off to do other music. They've gone away, they've gone away. Mm. And then they come back. Mm. There's so many of them. Because once you're in, you're in. You can't leave it alone. You know mm. what I mean? It's like a bug. So, that's how it continues to grow. And the commercial side is just, for me, just another side, you know what I mean? I can't shit on it because it's like, it's going to bring another audience to us, you know what I mean? And like I said before, even within the, the styles that I like, not every producer that I like is making the stuff that I like all the time. Mm. So, you know, I, you know, take it or leave it. Even on some of the commercial stuff, I've liked it, blah, 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 you know what I mean? Jump up stuff, I've liked it. Yeah. It's just a matter of, it's tune by tune for me. It's never, oh, this is shit, you know what I mean? The only thing that's really can be really sad is, when the money comes in, those who are in the uh, positions of power often tend to ignore the people whose knowledge they used in order to get themselves there. You know what mm. I mean? It's they're not all sort of all glorious about it, but the people who don't know anything about it, like some agents or whatever's promoters, they just see, oh, this product, yeah, blah blah blah. But you know, that's why I was really happy actually that um, Chase and State is. For, took a Brocky on, Brocky on tour. Mm. They respected the roots, you know what I'm saying? But I was thinking, <clears throat> with respect, I was thinking Chasing Status at that point because yeah. the, that for me, uh, I mean, Pendulum obviously, but P P Pendulum, you know, they, I think their intentions, it, it was undeniable, mm. the quality of the standard of production. Yeah. And, and they took it down a lane which, like you say, grossed a whole different kind of audience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I will say this. It's just a matter of the way things move in Radio 1 thing about it. So Groove Rider is still on Radio 1, right? Yes. They did... Uh, I don't know if it was on tour, but they booked Groove Rider several times to play before Folly went on stage. So I know that happened. But the problem is when you've got someone like uh, Groove Rider championing their sound and then it blows up, uh, someone else on a, a, a more well-known uh, show on well-known show on the radio on Radio One can play the same track, yeah. and then they get the recognition. Take for the it. heat, and Groove Rider don't get it. Exactly, and yeah. that's kind of what's been happening a lot, and that's what I kind of really don't like. You know what I mean? Like, take a. It's hard to know, in it. It's like drum bass is quite faceless, but it's like I really. Um, it'd be nice if people take a look back at where that. And follow the line back to yeah. where it came from, and then you can get the real core of what it's about. I totally feel you on that. Yeah. I think going back to source, respecting the, respecting the lineage, mm. super. Someone like Westwood, we we'll go back to Westwood. You know, he's really fought his corner really well, mm -hmm. and uh, actually, and uh, you know, unless something extremely surprising and uh, curveball ever happens, I genuinely Westwood can do no wrong as far as I just feel like he's been there from the jump, as has Groove Rider, um, and. 
yeah, even if you're not, even if you're not a chasing states or a pendulum or, or a, you know, a goldie, it's, and you're working in the industry, you're working as a PR or a publicist mm. or an agent, you need to respect the lineage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be nice. I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen, is it's it? Not but, gonna happen. No. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it would be nice, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I see these things, you know what I'm saying? I think that's the first time I talked about the Guru Rider situation, but I've seen a lot of situations like that, you know what I mean? Mm. Where it's sort of like we are nurturing and growing this thing and then it, it blows up enough and sort of like someone else with whatever big branded name plays one record and they get all the props. It ain't right, you know what mm. I'm saying? It ain't right. But... <clears throat> Even in my career and with the drum bass scene, I'm really about being the tortoise and not the hare. You, you know what I mean? It's really about longevity. Yes, so Groove Rider will find another, you know, pendulum and other things to you know, like champion and blah, blah blah. And we are constantly taking and building, and it goes taking, building, it goes taking, building. You know what I mean? Yeah. We are forever here. You know what I mean? It's been years now. You know mm. what I'm saying? Like how long we've known each other? Yeah. It's just nice to see you and be like, oh, you're yeah, still yeah. here. You know what I mean? Totally, dude. We're just doing our thing. We're we're the vehicle for what goes up. You know, yeah. we're dragging it, you know, from the, the uh, from underground level, and you know, hopefully making you know, giving some people some love and then mm. get you know, getting them some notoriety and stuff. That's kind of what our role is, I mm. guess. And I think we've had to accept that. And I don't. I mean, talking about talks in here. All right, let's talk about Madonna. You know, what I mean, how many times has she reinvented herself? Yeah, that's what. When you're up at that level, yeah, I would. It, keep coming up with new concepts or you're gone you're as good as your last record true you know I mean? yeah. so I'd rather just be alright the guy behind the scenes alright let me just do that and do that and yet I'm having a long career now a very long career yeah, yeah. and um, and as a contender as well cause just yeah. to interject and add value to that like you, yeah. you you're there you're still say so still your relevance mm. is you, it's more than just a fixture it's like you're part of the Tapestry yeah. now, even now, doing yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Always there, and like uh, you know, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of this, whether drum and bass is popular, it seems to be dictated by the magazines that don't give a shit about. Yeah, us it's true. Unless something's happening, yeah. you know what I mean? Oh, Jungle is dead. There's been articles out. Jungle is dead. Do you know what I mean? Like, really? It never stopped. If but they, it, it British, never stopped. British pub PR, they do that. They did it with punk, didn't they? they yes. Did it with, did it with UK hip hop. Yeah. They did it with drum and bass all the time. They do it with drum and bass. Yeah. Jesus Christ! Like yeah. It, seasonal to them it's like well actually just because it's a british genre just because it doesn't mean like the rest of the world still loves it yeah you I mean you've i've seen you travel bare my places my god i was not i didn't even know about holidays <laughs> right <laughs> i tell you man the places i've been to mm. i was like what am i doing in bloody costa rica <laughs> what's going on this is the only venue they've got where they would have a like a damien marley or whatever and we're in there playing drum and bass like wow Mad. I've seen some things and like there's places I still want to go to but it might not happen I know people have been to Kuala Lumpur there's, people, there's yeah. regular drum and bass nights in Hawaii you know what I mean like a regular drum and bass night that's how drum and bass has travelled you know what I mean they grew Rider and Fabio they must be just sitting there thinking to myself oh fucking hell like how did this ever come around to being like this mm. Do you know what I mean? Just those little... Was it Heaven? It was the, one of the early yes, spots, wasn't it? Yes, yes. That's when they got brought from the... Uh, the Club Night Heaven. Upstairs. It? it got two packs. Yeah. They brought them into the main room. Legendary yeah, stories. Yeah. Tell us some stories. Give us some... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm right. Okay. It's played in the field. It stays in the field. But there must be some awesome out-of-body... Uh, what the fuck am I doing situation that happened abroad. What, give, us some, give us some crazy tall story. Uh, wow, I don't know. These, there's so much that, I mean, like, they come out in conversation rather than me going, right, this moment. Oh, you know what, actually? <laughs> you know what? Go on. I ended up, I was in, where was I? I think I was in New York one time. And my agent who from Miami called me and said, we need to do this thing last minute. What is it? What is it? We need to go to Washington. So I flew into Washington and uh, I don't even know what it was, blah, blah, blah. Warm up set, DJ warm up set for James Brown concert. Uh, what? S stop. I can't remember what it's a huge basketball thing. James Brown was going to come on, and I did uh, a warm up set. I was like, and I didn't know until I went back, and my mate who lived there said, You know what that was? I was like, Wow, really? Is this readily known on the internet? No, no, not That's really. No, incredible. No, no. I was like, James Brown. My God. You warmed up for that, James. We'd get. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't see any billing or nothing. When I just was, 
like went through the back, blah, 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 got on the stage, played my set. And the thing is, I wasn't staying. I, I It was all time, so I flew immediately. I flew in, did the set, flew back to New York immediately after. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, the budget was there because it was, that's what, it, I mean. Yeah, yeah, so, but at the time you didn't know what it was for. And I was like, like well, this is yeah. really weird, you know what I mean? Oh, it was James Brown. What? Mm. <laughs> no. Couldn't believe it. Could not wow. believe it. Yeah. Those are like... That's just like nugget stories, man. Like, mm. like those golden moments, they build your armour on you. You know, you become yeah. really sold on yourself. Yeah. You know that you can handle mm. any situation. Mm. Fly on a plane, quickly get down there, don't know what it's for, get paid, I'm out. Mm. It's those sorts of scenarios that make you feel like you're, this, yeah. is a, this is a job role, this is a thing I'm doing. Yeah, like, wow, I was just mixing tunes in my bedroom, now I'm doing, doing this thing, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's crazy, like, where, how things have ended up, you know what I mean? Like, I never saw... Um, like Soul and Motion coming along. We've been doing that for seven years. I never saw One Extra coming along. I never saw the lineage with Metalheads, one of the most important labels mm -hmm. in drum. I never saw any of this stuff. And it's like, wow. So what is it? What is it? What, if you were to bottle it, what is that thing? For you personally, as, as Bailey, what, what do you think that the ingredient is that has allowed this sustainability for so long? I think a, a level of honesty within the music I play. Um, even at... Um, Gosh, when I did Metalheads last weekend, that went bonkers, right? And um, on the MC's going, the DJ's DJ. And I was like, what does that mean? You know what I mean? Sometimes promoters will book me and say, just do a Bailey set. And I'm like, what, what is a Bailey set? That's true, man. It's, there's, <laughs> it's just, there's tunes that we all know and there's tunes that people definitely want to hear mm -hmm. that they don't know about. So there's a difference between um, playing what you think that people want to hear and playing what you know they need to hear. Like, you need to hear this. Not playing like, oh, I know this is going to work. Play Just like, this one. You've got to hear this. And it's mm. that excitement for it, you know what I mean? I go, I'll dig and dig and dig. I get sent loads of stuff. I get about 100 tunes a week, right? And I get loads of absolutely crap tunes, you know what mm. I mean? And I listen to everybody. I don't care what level you're at because it's, it's that effort that gets you those little special ones, you know what I mean? Like, wow, who's this guy? What's this tune? Hit him up, get some more. Mm. And I think it's that amount of effort which counts. How much hours, how many hours do you spend on listening to tunes, demos, uh, tracks? Uh, yeah, because of other things, I have to spread it over a couple of days now. So, uh, you know, maybe once a week uh, on a Wednesday. A I couple would, of hours. Just till I can get through it. It'd be, it's, it's about four or five hours, you know what mm. I mean? And while, I'm, while that, the music's playing, I'm like putting, uh, you know, the dishes in the dishwasher and I'm tidying the place up and mm. blah, blah, blah and just doing that thing I meant to do last that week. That multitask shit, you know, that things that was music. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, not that one, go back to the computer. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that one, save it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 I listen, you know, I listen proper from the beginning, you know what I mean? I don't just jump in and go to the drop because mm. you don't get the whole story of the track then. I come from the beginning and I listen to it, I go, mm, yeah, I do or I don't like it. And it's, I think it's that effort of, like, really thinking about it because it's not even just... Um, I pick the tunes and it's done. They go into another folder and then I listen to all of those together. And sometimes someone's like, oh no, why did I pick that? And oh yeah, 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 that, that, this group, that works. You know what I mean? Incrementations, like, yeah. Breaking it down, breaking like sieving it, sieving it again, sieving it again. Oh God, I love that. Until that you're so good. Until you're like, this tune, just saying about this. I don't know, I've got to play this. You know what I mean? See, listen, lesson 101 for you. Lot. That, that's how you do it. That's what makes a metalhead DJ, mm. the journey. And knowing what the mood, having an option. Yeah. If the mood goes one way, you go that way. Da, da, da. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And sometimes with these tunes, I just don't even know. Like, I'm like, let me just put it in the folder if I don't know. And then when I sometimes come a bit short, I feel like I want something fresh, I go back in and I like, oh my God, how did I miss that? Sometimes tunes can be ahead of themselves as well. So you put them aside, you don't realize, I don't know what it is. Like, well, they're not... too fast forward, they're too forward ahead of themselves. Yeah, they're just, just different. They're just like, I don't know, I'm not sure about this. Mm. Let me just put it aside. And when you go back in the folder and look through, you're like, Wow, that, that's ready now. Pull that out. Pull that out. Pull that out. You know what mm. I mean? It's a lot of listening and going back and forth and just being absolutely sure of what you're doing. Which makes you study. You're yeah. a study of the craft. I study it, man. Study it, man. Like, I couldn't tell you catalogue numbers, but, you know, I know a hell of a lot, you know what I'm saying? Because I just re-analyse everything, you know mm. what I mean? Mm. That, um, that uh, anticipation of a white label, I mean, this is where the colours do start to get a bit blurred, right? Mm. Because there's no colours on those record sleeves. Yeah. And you, some of them don't even have writing on them. Yeah. That must have been a crazy time for you where you were just like getting bundles of like, you know, freshly pressed vinyl yeah. and you're just like having to sift through the stuff, huh? Well, imagine I worked in a record shop, so I had access to all yeah. this stuff. There you go. And as standard, like, uh, well, SRD anyway, they would send you 
every week. I'll tell you, um, Sadi. Oh, I heard that name for a while. They send you a package of yeah. records, like here's the, the test presses or promos. Yeah. Have a listen to that. Mm. And see what you want to order, you know what I mean? So they have stuff early, you know what I mean? Mm. A lot of them are white labels. Um, but there are also, even on a deeper level, like Rebel MC back in the day, like there's a lot of people like artists who they'd go to the pressing plant themselves, you know, they they do all the work and they will take tr drive around London to the record shops with uh invoices and you know, sale and return. So if you didn't sell whatever, you get those back, you know what I mean? It's like a lot of those little ones that weren't advertised and went on the radar were just behind the counter and it was down to Ray Keith or Nicky to go, oh, check this one out, you know what I mean? Oh, Those are the God. real kind of obscure kind of like, you were lucky to get one. You I know love mean? that. And I also love the work ethic of the old school, the way it really was a hustle mm, on, mm. A, on, a, on a material level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, how do I do this? Oh, well, you know what? I can't even bother to. Let me just take them in the car myself mm. and we can do a deal and if they don't sell whatever, I'll take them back and... It was just like that, man. It became a job. You're selling records to all these record shops. You could make some money off of that. Yeah, you know? yeah, you yeah. could. But yeah. you've got to really know your grind. You've got to... Yeah. Like Rebel put in the graft on that tip. Mm. I mean, this is the guy who did Street Tough. You know, yeah, like yeah, a chart sure. hit. And uh, here he was grafting out like this. And now he's Amazing. got a very, very solid brand. Like, you book him for festivals and stuff with his whole crew. It's about I mean, 10 or 12 of them on mm. stage. Yeah, very, very good, man. You know what I mean? That's what, that's what you get out of it when you put that effort in. Integrity. Mm. Roots mm. and integrity. Yeah, I think it's, you know, again, with me choosing to choose, it's just that level of, well, I've got to get in. You know what I mean, I want to know, I want to know, you know what I mean? Mm. So, you know, on top of that, you build the knowledge of new artists coming up or, you know, you see careers come and go and you see people leave and come back. Mm. And yeah, it's all that in there. It's mm. good. And even now, I mean, again, being the contender and the record creator, producer, man, fuck, we haven't gone to production. Oh, but yeah. yeah, but bro, like, yeah, let's get into that for a second because you've got the new bits coming out as well. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Like, Believe it or not, after all this time of doing remixes for this person yeah. and being like a track on that album and here, I never actually had a single. I never had my own release. That's bonkers, isn't it? It's crazy. <laughs> it's been years. You know what I mean? So it was well overdue and it just kind of happened. You know what? Lockdown made that happen. Made Lockdown you, made, you think, made that made happen. Made think, yeah. It just like, I had time to, because I was working from home all the time. So I had time to, oh, you know what? Let me just, actually, no. Going back more, uh, even deeper into it is the fact that when I was making tunes, I was like, that's not going to fit into what goes on there. It's not going to fit in. It's not going to work. And after a while, I wanted some liquid flavours that I wanted to play, but everything was, there's a lot of piano-y, generic, like it's a brand, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And I come from the, you know, the soul and the Motown. And I was like, I want this. This is what I want. So I said, you know what? Forget about what the rules are. Reset. And I could afford to do this because I had a job, you know what I mean? And, so it was like, forget about if it comes out. No, I don't care. I don't care. I'm just making this for me. I'm making this for me. I'm making this for me. That's for me. That's for this. All right. I haven't got enough Dillinger right now. Let me make this Dillinger one. Let me do that. I end up with about 30 tracks during lockdown. 30? About 30 tracks. 30 plus tracks. Now, a lot of them are sort of That's mad. remixes and mashups and VIPs. I did like all kinds of stuff. I did... Um, and like everybody that I've done, like the big tunes, like VIPs of, I've called them up and say, look, just to let you know, this thing exists. Are you right with it? So I did the VIP of um, Alien Girl. I did a VIP of mm. Metropolis. I did a VIP of Deadline. I did a VIP of uh, P Funk Era. You know what I mean? The list goes on. And these what? were all just dub plates for my sets. For, for your sets? They weren't never. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. They're never designed to be like, all right, let's put this out. You know, I'm just, look, look, I'll just call them and say, look, I'm not interested in this coming out, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And that's actually how the. Um, I did a Mr. Fingers, Can You Feel It uh, bootleg. And I hit up Tracks Records and there was like no interest. And I was like, oh, you know, if you want to give away for free, I'm not looking for no money, just whatever, whatever. And there was no interest. So, you know, on Soul in Motion, we give that away for free. And that's kind of out of that batch has come these two tracks that is going to come out as a single now. You know so what everything mean? happens for a reason. Yeah, so it's just so like, I just said, you know what? I don't care. I don't mm. care if it doesn't sell. Let me just make these tunes. And then mm. like, someone's gone, I like that. What are you doing with that? You know what I mean? Like, mm. oh, yeah. Okay, you want to... Dog is putting it out on Precinct. And actually, tonight is the, um, the launch party. The launch for, party, yeah, yes. Big up for that. Hold tight for yeah. that because, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's been the, the newest uh, release yeah. of, of your catalogue this year. Yeah. So it's great. Yeah, it's, it's just mad how things have evolved. Um, the very first track that I did come out as it, that was a remix was actually an accident too, or maybe not, I'm not sure. So that was a case whereby I think Ronnie Sires had made a track... Um, and I wanted to have that track. I heard him play. I was like, oh, look. I was at that stage where I could just call people and say, oh, mate, can I have that? Or I called the record label. And then this CD turns up in the post. You know what I mean? Of like, it's the parts to the track. And I call them back and I say, 
I think there's a, 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 a there's a mistake here. You sent me the parts to the track and the track. I just wanted just the track. No, no, no. We want you to do a remix. I'm like, what? You want us to do a remix for Ronnie Size? Love it. Okay, so that was. I did the Forget Me Nots remix. Wow. You know what I mean? And I, I met with a guy called Gerald yesterday. I did a remix for him or a remake of a, the one tune that really made me full time sort of leave hip hop behind and go into mm. like the early hardcore days and that. Yeah. Um, guy called Gerald, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good man. He's a good man. Uh, Legend. Yeah. Uh, I won't spill the beans on on that conversation. Really, is <laughs> just it? in case nothing comes out of it. But <laughs> 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 but yeah, I mean, I'm just constantly thinking about this stuff now, and I'm just like at a stage where I'm like, I just want to make stuff that makes me happy. I don't care if if, if no one's interested, mm. because that's what you get into it in the first place. It's self satisfaction. The music, you know what I mean? Like in the early days when I'm playing music to myself, I'm buying stuff and like really satisfying my soul. Mm. It's got to go back to that. It's got to be a level of honesty in it. You know what I mean? That's so, right. And from a live point of view, like you're saying, like the dubs, the dubs, the dub plates, and what, like let's 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 be real. There's been best part of two years, nothing going on. Mm. Been that, in that time, people have been building their arsenal of yeah, yeah, ammunition. Yeah. Yeah. So with not only the backup of like a load of two years worth of unpaid but to be scheduled gigs, mm. you've also got weaponry that's just going to like pepper sounds. This exactly. Time. And like because I'm so not interested in saying, hey, that was me, you know, these little uh, Metropolis dub plates or other ones that I've done, I didn't even put my name on it. I've made up some other name, you know what I mean? So people go, what is that? I go, yeah, oh, that's by blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? It's me has made it though. You know what I mean? So I don't tell anybody. Why? Um, because I'm just not about the glory on that. I just want to be able to have, uh, and if people want it, I don't want people to go, oh, let me have that, let me have that, let me have that. I just want to have some things for my set. Bearing in mind, right? Yeah. When I was building these things, I hadn't made a lot. I have not, I'm not one of those known, known producers, right? So for me to have exclusive tunes for my set is very important. You know what I mean? As 100%. a DJ, you know what I mean? Because like these days, I mean, I was one of the last few with like Friction or whoever to come through just purely off of DJing, right? Yeah. After that, it was like, if you're making big tunes, you can get DJ work yeah, yeah. and no one can come in through like that way again, just as a DJ. It just doesn't happen no, it anymore. It doesn't, no. It's, you make a big tune and then like, okay, they're on you, you can play here, whatever. And so it's important for me, who for someone who wasn't making uh, a, a tracks to have, you know, there's... A bespoke set. Exactly. And I think, oh, yeah, you, you want to hear more of this? I've got this stuff. You mm. know what I mean? You'll have like, to book me. Yeah. You want to hear that? I've got those. Mm. You know, and I've got more. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got loads. I've got loads. I've got loads. Really? I've got a lot, yeah. Just got loads got of weaponry. Like... People are DMing me going, oh, what's that alien thing? And I'm like, oh, yeah, because there's an audio. Mind your business. <laughs> there's one by audio. So there's audio and that other one. And there's another one as well. So, and there's another one. And I don't say, oh, that's me. You know what I mean? That, that that's actually it's extremely calculative when you think about it. Is when it? You think, yeah, I do. What was it? Why? Well, okay. it's 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 thankless on your part. I mean, yeah, everyone's got a little ego rub here and there. You know, even the most timid of people. Mm. But what I really value about that is the Daft Punk effect, the incognito of mm. the actual song themselves. Yeah, it's almost like. Oh, it's just that version of that, da da da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it leaves a mystique and makes people run around like fucking yeah, yeah. Herbert's trying to find the thing. Yeah. When you're really just sitting back saying, well, actually, it's me and you're never ever going to be able to find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so cold. And, you know, for me, I feel like uh, a lot of the young generation have been brought up with the internet and stuff. We're quite spoiled. Yeah. You know, um, they just think because I'm an email away, they can just ask me for any track. You know what I mean? I mean, I this is like, I'm talking about like uh, other uh, DJs and producers. Oh, I, I heard you've got that. I heard it in a set. Can I have that? No, I, actually, I, I, I'm so, it's so awkward. I end up not saying anything. Mm. And I accidentally air them out. You know what I mean? Because I was like, how do I reply? How do I say no to this person? Like, these are my efforts that got me these, you know, exclusive tunes. It's a sport mentality. You know, it doesn't it? mean that you can just go, oh, I've heard that. Can I have that? It's just not like that. It just don't work like that. So that's why it also, on the tunes, I'm sort of like, you don't need to know. So the moral of the story is he's, he's a fucking good guy. Don't ask him for shit because he's worked his ass off to do it. You know what I mean? He's done making, put him in a comparable situation. Like, there's Simple. all kinds of, you know, I've got pff, my my selection of unreleased Dillinger tracks is a bananas. Oh my. The what, selection got, of how, unreleased how many, how many Bad Company. I don't know. I, I don't know. How many Bad Companies have you got? <gasps> Loads of unreleased bad companies. Because, of course, you're the radio DJ, so you've got all these Yeah, bits. but you see the thing, like, I know these, like, you know, you hear old tapes from back in the day and, like, you might have heard something and it's like, oh, no one's playing it anymore. That, that hasn't come out. Who's what? 
Brian, this tune, do you know about this? Oh, yeah, it's blah, blah, blah. I sent it to you. And they know I collect these, so they're sending stuff out. D Bridge is calling me. Uh, <laughs> Ed Russian Obstacle, Virus Vaults. He called me to compile those. Uh, compile the albums because really? I'm the guy that cl- collects all that stuff and keeps it all. You know what I mean? So the, uh, the uh, uh, all the tech step stuff that didn't come out. I've got loads of that. I've got loads of the digital. I've got loads of like, you know, I'm just fanatical about getting this like that music, like that one that really all oh, that. What's that? I need that. What's that? Chasing it down. So then, when someone, so going back to it now, when someone hits me and says, "I can have that," they don't understand the effort behind me getting mm. that. It wasn't just there. I've had to chase it around and find out mm. who and what. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do know. So that's why I'm just like, it's awkward. I can't reply. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel you. It, it's, it's, and it's, it's so compromising, isn't it? Yeah. Because you know what will happen. They'll take the shine for it. Or, or, just, or not even that. They're, it'll just become widely known. And that's what you don't just want. Just rinsed, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, nothing special anymore, you know what I mean? And with the resurgence again, with the vinyl, with the... Uh, uh, vinyl doing well. People are starting to put out a lot of unreleased stuff on vinyl mm. and stuff. You had dubs from the dun- dun- uh, dubs from the dungeon, which is uh, what was it? Dom Rollins, uh, 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 his imprint as well, uh, offshoot of his other label. And you got Deep Jungle doing that a lot. You know what I mean? Mm. And because they're doing so well, they, I mean they know what they're doing. They're marketing it, but, but everybody thinks they can do it. So now there's phone calls coming in, the emails going, oh, have you got this? Have you got that? And I have to just lie, you know what I mean? Mm. Because you're just on a rinse. You just want to rinse it. You don't mm. care about the tune. And furthermore, if that is your music, you should have looked after that. It's yeah. not for me to hold this down for you. Yeah. Some randomer hit me up recently. Oh, I heard you got Voodoo Magic tapes because they were never released. They were just for artists and Flux was MC for them, so Flux gave me the original copies. Mm-hmm. Can I have the tapes? I'll uh, post them to me and I'll send them back. I'm like, why would I do that? I didn't hold on to these tapes from 1994 just to let you have them and get some glory. It don't work like that. And that kind of upsets me, you know what I mean? So I'm not that a That sounds to me like the more, bo- more of the bugbear than anything else was yeah, in the genre. Yeah, it's like, I'm not here preserving stuff just for you to have it. I mean, the other day, I forgot about these flyers in my mum's loft. I've got uh, eight, nine boxes of flyers going back to 1991 because I come out the raves and I collect them. Some of them, they're still in the flipping plastic or you can, you, you can smell the print on them still. There's, oh, that is There's no awesome. creases in them. And now I've got people saying, oh, I heard you got these flyers. I'm like, no, 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 no. I looked after these. You should have done the same thing. Mm. This is my collection. I'm a collector. You know what I mean? So mm. I'm a collector of music and things to do with rave and that. And yeah, maybe I should put that together. And yeah, I was just going to say this. I was trying to think of a pun, some sort of Bailey Basement you know, book, no, something that's from the underground, like with all this stuff. I need, to, that... I need to do an exhibition or something. You need to do an exhibition or a book or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a you lot know what you of could stories. do? You could do like an online um, drop in virtual exhibition where you haven't even actually got to take stuff out, but it could be all present, ever present. People can walk around mm. in there and see all this stuff. Yeah, and just, you know, because I wouldn't want it to, I want people to actually see these things. Like, this tape, this is from 1990, whatever, and uh, no one's got this. Or I've got versions of tracks that artists don't have themselves. You have to do it yourself, bro. I'll tell you why, because a lot of those art cultural council things and people that use these museums to to document, you know, street culture, etc., doesn't matter what genre it is, mm. they just ask and take, ask yeah. and take, ask and take. Yeah, we need it for our archive. Mm. You've got your archive. You own that shit. You can make shit. Go get it. I've 100%. just had a light bulb moment. I'm going to approach somebody about this. 100%. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to. Because if you're getting DMs from people wanting shit, then there's an interest, isn't there? Yeah, and from like people that within the scene kind of know I have this stuff but for some random person to say oh I know you've got this can I it's like okay the words out there I've got all this stuff you know what I mean and I've got a lot a lot of stuff I've even got the original what is it Metalheads did a shoe with um, DC shoes back in the day I never put them on because I didn't really fancy them you know what I mean but I've still got those in pristine condition you know what I mean all this stuff needs to be seen you know Um, yeah I need to speak to Goldie actually Mm. again because you know he's just recently done the uh, what is it? Is it collaboration with who is it with again? Shoe? Uh, no, it's like a really big fashion company. It might be Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton. Yeah, Louis Vuitton. Yeah. He's done a record box, a metal one like that. It's worth about three grand. I oh, need to shit. have that. It's like a metal box. It's, That's the, it's the a record paramount. box. I need those. Those sort of things. I'm like, oh god, I've got to have that. You know what I mean? Not just because I want to be seen with it. You don't see me mm. really posting that stuff. You know what I mean? And. I've kept all sorts of stuff, like my original dub plate box. I used to cut so many dub plates. I used to go uh, Australia, New Zealand every year for 12 years, like uh, annually. 
and I'd have so many dub plates, I had to get a, a custom flight case, you know, uh, so for it doesn't my dub plates. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's been all around the world. You see all the flight stickers from, from different airline companies and but stuff. But you built that for the dub plate because they're well, sensitive motherfuckers, those dub plates. Yeah, they are, yeah. No, it was like some company, you know, the record box came around with, with the rounded corners on it. Someone That's had right. designed a, a mini version of it. And I see Ray Keefer when I was, uh, with one. And I was like, what did you get? Like, oh, we got in Black Market. Someone on Black Market and got one. And this box is just covered with Air mm. Canada and mm. Air this and Air that. You should see it. I put it on the internet and people are like, wow, this is a piece of the history from the past. So I'm like, yeah, actually, you know what it is? At the moment, it just holds hammer and nails. And mm. you know what I mean? It's like my DIY box. But I'm just like, you know what? That's That that box has got a lot of stories to tell. So that's why I think maybe I should put a little something together so people can see these things. But people you know I mean? misunderstand the hoarder thing. Because you, you said it a couple of times as we were talking. And I, I've... I, when it comes to when it comes to people's possessions and how they um, and what they're collecting, yeah. there's a lot of people out there that will, uh, I'm, I'm contributed to this. I just throw things away because mm. I think well, I haven't worn it for six months. What's the point? Mm. Or if if it if things change, shit changes, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, things yeah. happen. But, but if you're you know regimented enough and say to yourself, no, no, I'm going to keep this. Mm. You actually, that's your cultural currency. Hold tight, Leke, aerosol, ask you give me that. Mm -hmm. But it's your cultural currency, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, I've, I've been really gutted recently. I moved house uh, from one place to another in Fort Neve, and I had a bag of t shirts with just like, you know, there was like a chemistry memorial one, and, yeah. and also I've, I lost wow. this. There's certain things like, if there's one thing I've had a lot of, after records, it's bloody T-shirts, you know what I mean? And I can only store so many, so I give them to cousins and blah, blah, mm. blah, after a while. Clothing's a bugbear, ain't it? After a while, you won't be see I won't be wearing <laughs> this because it's like, here I am on your podcast, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, he's, is that only, any T-shirt he's got? Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? you got to yeah, keep yeah. it moving. Yeah, so right. um, I give them away in the end, and um, I lost this bag of really important T-shirts, man. Man, oh. There's some things I have lost, but yeah, I mean, I've got a hell of a lot of stuff. You know, wow. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most prized possession? Um, weirdly enough, <laughs> mm -hmm. when Wu Tang the Pain came out on PlayStation, they gave that away in a special box with a uh, a blood drip in it. it, had fluids in it, and it had a bottle of pills on it. I've still got the bottle of pills, and I make sure I keep that safe for some reason. It's like a Wu Tang subscription, like bottle with like, a brown bottle, but it's got mints in it. But it's supposed to look like paint. It's got, it's got pills in it. I think they're painkillers. And it's or got the like. logo and everything. Yeah, it? it's got logo and everything. So when I did, when uh, when lockdown happened, and Shorty Blitz was Shorty Blitz was doing his live streams, uh, is like and they all said, "Oh, anyone who's got anything to do with Wu Tang, find it now." Blah blah blah. Because do the Wu Tang day, mm. right? And I showed these pills, and I was just like. Where'd you get that from? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. That's just from a computer game, you know what I'm saying? Mm. But there's going to be others, but um, that's what comes to mind right now. I like to keep things like that because, like, wow, look at this cool little thing. Mm. You know what I mean? Let me mm. keep that. Need to do a museum, bro. You need to make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, there's there's plenty of heritage there that just needs to be yeah. out there in the public. The there's, a there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of stories. And these little stories, like the things with the Groove Rider and Pendulum and Brockin, and there's a lot of things that ain't spoken of that mm. I think are really important, so people understand, you know, that we, you know what I mean, the underground, we're just with the roots of it, you know what mm. I mean. We're always there, and we don't, um, unless people are really blatantly exploiting us, you know what I mean. We don't really grumble about it. We know our position, you know yeah. what I mean. So understand what you have, where it came from, and I think it's important to put that timeline down, everyone to see mm. all of that history, you know what I mean. It's a beautiful thing, man. Yeah, yeah, and the and the release is on its way, so we'll get this out as soon as possible. Right. Yeah, um, it's gonna be end of the month, end of the month. What's okay, the date? I think it's like twenty eighth. It comes out beautiful. The twenty eighth. Shame yeah. about carnival. That would have been gone down, wouldn't it? Get I know. And as it is, my favorite festival, Sun and Bass, where I've been going to for like twelve, maybe fifteen years, even um, every year. Um, that's not happened for the last two years. So I'm gutted about that as well. Because mm. you talked about, oh, tell me a story, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if you talk about a special moment consistently, Sun and Bass is the, like, you go there and it's just like, it's not like any other festival. It's really, it's quaint. Well, for know. those who don't know where that is, where, where about? It's in Sardinia. Beautiful it's Sardinia. It's in Sardinia. In the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it one of those kind of sun comes up moments while you're DJing sort of thing? Um, it is a bit like that. It's the euphoria of the last night coming out and you, go out and the beach is in front of you and everyone's just sitting on the beach and the sun's coming up. It's, oh, it's beautiful. God. It's really hard to explain, but I've not in all my years seen a place where 
men have got upset and actually start weeping and crying because they've got to go home. Ask Brian Belfortune about that. Ask really? Brian Belfortune how that, he's done it. He not he. It's hard to describe what it is, but it's something about that place and the people. Because there's no VIP areas, there's no champagne busing, there's no like bougie shit going on. Mm. You know what I mean? Everybody is just like, we're here. This is our music. You know what I mean? It's all oh. one big community. You know what I mean? And it doesn't alienate anybody. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's just a beautiful vibe. It's a real honest. Uh, how you hoped it would be about the egos and dramas and shit mm. kind of festival, you know what I mean? Mm, 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 mm. It's special, really special. Mm. Yeah. Well, the future's bright. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is for me at the moment, at least. Anyway, mm. there's <laughs> so much going on. Yeah. I'm talking around London doing this and doing that, you know what I mean? Um, I told people a long time ago on my Facebook, I said, look, even if you don't really see me, my face as much as, uh, as, much as you used to, right? I'm always going to be like in my bedroom playing music because this is what I like, you mm. know what I mean? Like, it doesn't matter about me uh, trying to, you know, things happen by organically and they have. Mm. Like me being here with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't want to call you and say, oh, can I come on? But I really want to come mm. on, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I really want... Such a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, dude. I really want to come on. But it's, it happens organically. So It happens, it just, it, yeah. It's yeah. when it, it's when just worlds are perfectly aligned and it's like yeah let's do it yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good thing and i guess you use the, the the lockdown to your advantage bearing in mind that you're doing you yeah. the whole time absolutely there might come a time when people want to see my face about but i'll be doing what i did when i was in the 80s in my bedroom playing tunes to myself for four hours with door shut you know what i mean it's just it's a habit you know what i mean it's like I need this for my soul. It's sort of like, uh, it's a saviour of a lot of people. You see Kenny Kelly in documentaries talking about how it kept him out of trouble. He was in and out of jail, blah, blah, blah. It's true, man. You know what I mean? It's kept a lot of people who needed that escape, you know, on a level. Mm. You know what I mean? It could be much troubled place, much more troubled world without um, yeah. without music, let alone jungle drum and bass. You know That's, what right. Mean? That's right. That's right. Thank you so much for contributing over the years, brother. Man. Oh, you keep on talking about this and not seeing your face. I hope we see more of your face, brother. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, it is lovely. There's moments. Yeah. But I've done a lot and I'm not I'm not ready to stop, but um I appreciate that if things slow down. I've done so much now. So much, so much, so many countries, so many brands and people that have been that are just like you know, pick up the phone, oh, you're right, mate. You know what I mean? It's like I wouldn't have seen that coming. Like the way I'm aligned now with not aligned, but like Jumping Jack Frost is my mate now. You know mm. what I mean? I pop round there. He's cooking food. You know what I mean? He's food. Oh, frosty you know, it's man. Like, oh, it's a guy. different world now. Mm. And I never aspired to be anyone of these people's friends. I, it just, it just happened this way. And it's really a pleasure to be amongst all these talented people. Everyone, you, you mm. know what I mean? Yeah. You, Here you are over everything you've done. You know what I'm saying? It's reciprocated. It's yeah, infectious. Man. Your your energy is yeah. It's just. It's, it's yeah. fantastic. And more. Viva. Viva the Bailey. <laughs> Thank that's, you. That's what I'm saying. There's people that want to be involved in this, like, real, really badly. We're, we're lucky people. We are lucky people, We're lucky we? people. Yeah. yeah. And stay, just stay in, stay present and just enjoy every moment. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no doubt. You know what I mean? Like, it's just... It's just the way it is. <laughs> just just, just the way we are now. Just can't, can't help it. Back, yeah. <laughs> yeah, can't help it. <laughs> yeah. Bailey, you're a star. Thanks so much for passing through, my brother. Thank you for having Wicked, me, man. What mate, a pleasure. Mate. What are you saying on that? Killer Killer Podcast coming back at you again. You know, Sharon is caring. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Bailey now. I actually forgot we were on video, man. I was talking to <laughs> <laughs> I got him again. Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't. Stay lucky, people. Peace. Peace. Woo. Yo.